Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news bulletin for today, August 21st, 2012. The links will be posted in YouTube's video description. We're going to talk about Asia and just to kind of segue into that, um, finish up with Kurdistan here. You know, one of the things with World War II that you saw um, afterwards was the creation of the United Nations, right? You know, it's all about peace and ending, you know, the war to end all wars, because that's what the elites really want. They want uh, total domination and capitulation. They call it peace and the end of sovereignty, individual sovereignty and stuff like that. But what else did we see? We saw the creation of the state of Israel, and I think that was one of the biggest things. Um, I don't know if, if Germany and, and Hitler and all of them, I don't know if they knew that, exporting or basically getting Jews out of Europe was actually part of the plan the whole time. I don't know that. But it happened. And um, and so the, with Kurdistan, they are kind of like the same thing, right? Oh, they're the largest ethnic group without a country. So they're, they're kind of like in the same boat as a Jewish population. So who knows? Maybe, you know, the whole thing with Syria is a create uh, a, a Kurdistan, which will then be wreaking havoc, right? Like I was talking about the drugs and stuff like that and smuggling of op poppy and, uh, and opium through Afghanistan and Turkey and stuff like that. It could just be another drug corridor. But either way, moving on to Asia, U.S. drone kills five militants in northern Pakistan. So it says here that a missile launched from a U.S. drone struck a suspected militant. Uh, this could be, remember, Obama actually admitted this. A suspected militant could be anyone between the ages of like 19 and and 50, uh, a fighting age, basically, and a male. So <laughs> any poor uh, sap on a farm hideout in a tribal region in northern Pakistan were allies of a powerful warlord were gathered Saturday, killing five of his supporters, maybe his employees. And Pakistan is such a weird place because it's a nuclear state, and a lot of people forget that or they don't think about it, that Pakistan has nuclear weapons. And you're like, you know, how, do, how does that happen, you know? And why was Bush all of a sudden working with Pakistan, um, you know, in what, 2002 and 2003 and all that? Well, Pakistan has their own internal problems, but... You know, they kind of have a puppet government going on over there. And so I think that's why they're allowed to have nuclear weapons. So I wouldn't really expect the Pakistan government to really represent their people and end these drone strikes. I mean, I watched an interview with one of their representatives, a female, and it's basically what they were saying. You know, Pakistan is reluctant to take on the terrorists, take on an offensive there. So they're, they're not going to – they don't want to really fight these, quote, terrorists. Um, but they don't want to remain weak in the eyes of the West, uh, you know, the people that are funding, funneling all this money into them. U.S. under pressure over drone raids. It says here, United Nations called on the U.S. to release the footage of its deadly assassination drone strikes in different parts of the globe or face an international inquiry. So the international community wants to know what's going on. I don't think you need to see footage. I don't need to see footage, guys. Do you? Do you need to see footage of... Some dude walking on the street, like uh, Bradley Manning footage that released it, and just taking pot shots with 50 caliber machine guns out of a helicopter, blowing people into pieces, little bits of body parts on the cement. Do you need to see that to know that this is happening? No, I don't need to see it. I know the CIA is running drone strikes out of Ethiopia and that. Different parts of Africa. I and mean, look at this. CIA takes over Eth Ethiopian regime as it, quote, crumbles. And yeah, actually, this guy just died. He died during a treatment for a mystery illness, kind of like a mystery heart attack. So, you know, I'm going to go into this about how the CIA worked with Pakistan to create the Taliban. Um, but this is what I'm talking about. They're going to rewrite their history. Just rewrite it all, right? You know, oh, yeah, you know, they helped uh, create the ta Taliban, the CIA and, and Pakistan and all them. And they used them against Russia, and now they, quote, have to deal with them. So why Afghanistan's past is being rewritten. So the education ministry has endorsed a new history curriculum for school students that deletes nearly four decades of the country's war-torn past. So the textbooks said that they will bring unity in a country where traditionally polarized along ethnic and political lines. So, And that's what it's always used, right? Religion. 
when they're talking about ethnic, they're talking about like uh, religious sex, and they're talking about uh, political lines. You know, are you tr pro tribal government, pro regular national government? And that just splits everybody up and makes it easier to control them. But back to the Taliban, critics accuse ministers of trying to appease the Taliban and other powerful groups by erasing history that portrays them in a bad light. They say the government is trying to win over the Taliban before NATO and U.S. forces leave the country. Yeah, so there's no mention of all the coups and the Soviet and Moscow-backed communist regimes in Kabul, the... Um, it says here, not much of the U.S.-led forces that drove them from power and stayed for more than a decade. That's right, because it's all one big company, one big family of families, right? We call the New World Order. And it's about business, it's about drugs and that. And so CIA worked with Pakistan to create Taliban. The Central Intelligence Agency worked in tandem with Pakistan to create the monster that is today Afghanistan's ruling Taliban, a leading U.S. expert on South Asia said. He said, I warned them we were creating a monster. And some of you probably saw this news, India and Russia are going to uh, ink a biggest deal, defense deal ever, worth $35 billion, India's quest for futuristic stealth fifth generation fighters, which will see the country spend around $35 billion over the next 20 years, and the biggest ever defense project has zoomed into the decisive phase now, sorry. Uh, and, you know, we're at a time now where you're seeing people pulling out funds and George Soros and now Buffett, he's pulling out of municipal bonds and Soros uh, getting into gold, dumping his hedge funds. Um, you have Rothschilds betting against the euro um, as the as the United States, I think, personally, um, you know, who knows if it's ever going to collapse the rigged economy, but it just seems that it's becoming more hollowed out and a rust bucket. But like I said, who, who knows, you know, I'm sure there's going to be big corporations that are coming in there and exploiting all these resources here and exploiting all the desperate workers, the big pull of desperate workers. I'm sure they're exploiting all that, so you'll see signs of, quote, growth. But I think that uh, a, war, a war for these people is always good in these times, uh, to start some kind of war, conflict. It's good for the defense complex, like the space war with the Russians, you know. I'm sure they were all liking that. The Cold War was great for the military-industrial complex. There was no actual war war. It was just a lot of buying of weapons and manufacturing. It's scaring the shit out of people to take cover. It says here, India boring border tunnels to take on China and Pakistan. They're finally kick-starting a plan to build as many as 18 tunnels along the borders with Pakistan and China for faster troop mobility as well as storage of critical war-fighting assets like missiles with the threat of detection by enemy satellites and spy drones. So India's yeah, definitely been getting ready for something. It says here, Ham welcomes regionally aligned brigade focused on Africa. This is the Dagger Brigade. That's right. We'll also become the first army unit to be regionally aligned with a specific unified combatant command. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, U.S. AFRICOM, basically, is what they call it. U.S. Africa Command welcomes the arrival of next spring of an army brigade to support U.S. engagement on the African continent. And most people think, oh, yeah, they're going for Coney. That's all they know is Coney. The guy's 80% chance already dead. They're going to catch a, get a dead guy, but it has nothing to do with that. What they're actually doing is they're securing the continent of Africa for Asia. See, it's all it's all said. It's all brokered deals. You know, like with Russia, you know, oh, uh, you know, the powers that be, whatever, all these families get together and tell the Romanovs, or, you know, we're going to import com something called communism. It's, you know, we're going to import that into your country. You know, you got rid of the czarist system and stuff like that. People want something different. They want to feel like they have a choice. Well, we're going to import this system that we've hatched in a laboratory with all our psychologists and sociologists and these geniuses that want to bring about global governments. We're going to import that as this sick system and uh, put this atheist leader in there. And, you know, a lot of people are going to die, maybe, you know, 50, 50 million at least. Not including the amount of people who are going to starve of, and, and die of disease and torture and murder by the state afterwards. But eventually, you're going to get your economy back. You're going to, get, you're going to emerge from this. You're going to become more of a free market style uh, system. While at the same time, the same system, that same system is being imported into the United States. And then they'll come up with this, uh, this one system that's a, that's a hybrid between both of them will emerge. And we're living in that right now, I think, where it's very deceptive. You don't know what's happening. You know, it's very corporatized, like RT now. Ooh, question more, right? Well, I question, are they owned by intelligence agencies? 
That's what I question. You know, is Alex Jones, is, is he a shill? Is he, he is a Zionist? What is he, you know? But that's what it is. It's your money and it's your blood, sweat, and tears or the armies and that that's going to do this. And they're, and they're going to broker this deal that was hatched, what, you know, way back then, right? You had the 150-year plan, Albert Pike and all that, uh, basically laying it out. And they, they, get what, they get what they want because they use violence. And everybody else uses and participates in this violent system and legitimizes it. So you have Francis Galton, letter to the editor of the Times, June 5th, 1873. So, yeah, it's basically what? Africa for the Chinese. It says here uh, that uh, basically it's suitable places on the east coast of Africa, a part of our national policy and belief that the Chinese immigrants would not only maintain their position, but that they would multiply and their descendants would supplant the inferior Negro race. I should expect a large part of the African seaboard now sparsely occupied by lazy, palavering savages living under the nominal sovereignty of Zanzibar or Portugal might in a few years be tenanted by industrious, order-loving Chinese. So there you go. That's, uh, you know, the head of the father of eugenics, social engineering and that. And hailed as a, as a god in, in a lot of colleges. As scary as it is. China checks into Africa with checkbook diplomacy. That's right. Outmaneuvering out everybody else is a strategic calculation with respect to cultivating relationships with Africa. I guess that's what they're calling them. Relationships. Actually, they call it the China-Africa Cooperation on China-Africa Strategic Partnership. Just like a heroin dealer, you get your you know first fixes for free. $20 billion of credit line for African countries in the next three years. So yeah, it's always about what China will build more technology, and this is the way the elitists see it, right? When you look back on history, you always say what? Oh yeah, you know, it's like uh, that was progress, right? That was progress. While at the same time, when you're living in it in real time, when these quote changes happen, it's at the force of a gun. Someone has a gun pointed at you, saying, "Well, you're going to do this or else, right? You're going to capitulate. You're going to change your way of living. I know you want to live simply and live off the land, or you're not going to do that." You're going to get a, quote, job, you're going to be a wage slave, and uh, you're going to like it. And if you're not, we're going to kill you. And then they say, oh, that's changed. Just got to accept it. That's just the way things are. And then you look back 20, 50, 100 years and say, man, you know, I don't know how they used to live like that. You know, uh, this is so great progress. China sinking big bucks into African news, i.e. propaganda. So critics say propaganda, but Chinese call it good PR. So you make your own decision, right? And just like with Iran... We're going to move to Central Asia here and that, in Asia. Um, just like with Iran, everything being focused on Iran while other countries are going down, right? And, quote, under the guise of trade, they create things like NATO and, uh, and SCO, right? It's for trade. It's for business, right? So that they can consolidate, um, consolidate all of this wealth and the resources so they can exploit them and that they can have lax regulations for these big, huge corporations. But like what I see, though, with Central Asia, is they're going to do the same thing. They'll use Georgia, because Georgia is a good proxy state, where they could be west, it could be east, you know, they're kind of neutral, I guess. But uh, they're going to go after all these countries around it, Kyrgyzstan, whatever, you know, um, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, all these countries, and it's all going to be focused on, is this Georgia nuclear? Is, has Georgia gone nuclear? Or it could be any country, right? While well, all the other countries are going down. So keep your eye on that in the, in the future. It says here, U.S. Army Command develops caucuses linked military scenarios. So, yeah, it's a, uh, it says here, a conflict between Europe and the Middle East remains a complicated tangle of security concerns. Except this time, it'll actually be what? Russia, right? It says here, especially as Georgia desperately seeks NATO membership, Russia has left a significant cross-member scar that would not likely heal with Georgia. So it could be actually be Russia taking the place of the U.S. and maybe Georgia taking the place of Iran. And the game goes on. U.S. Navy is adding surveillance planes, drones to its Asia-Pacific fleet. No big surprise there. Talking about the Japan and China dispute. An Arab Spring scenario in Central Asia, so that's going to be rigged, of course, an Arab Spring in Central Asia, so that they could have SCO and NATO uh, basically fight over the Eurasian Balkan um, slave complex. Russian military deploys 4th Regiment of these missiles to the country's Far East. Also, a Russian attack submarine sailed in Gulf of Mexico undetected for weeks. Neither Turkey or Azerbaijan will allow Russia to give military support to Armenia. Ukraine wants to secretly export weapons to Armenia, and Iran looks to Armenia to skirt bank sanctions. 
and Kazakhstan predicts U.S. base in Uzbekistan.